everybody. Good afternoon session. I hope it doesn't look very loud. Uh, so my name is Sophie Dimopoulos, and uh, as you heard, I work as a data science consultant at IT Logics. And for the next uh, 30 minutes, I'll talk about how to use publicly available geodata to have in Switzerland uh, for various, uh, create value for various business uh, applications. So I'll start my talk by saying a few things about uh, today's uh, world's data scenery. Uh, the, the world stock of data has uh, increased many orders of magnitude, I'm sure you all know that. And at the same time, it has been transformed from um, uh, analog to digital. And this particular uh, change, this new digitalization era we're, we're, we're going through, at least we went through the past 15 years, brought about uh, severe changes into many businesses. A lot of businesses that didn't adapt to this new digitalization era, they even confronted bankruptcy. Now, successful business nowadays, of course, uh, they have adapted, for sure. They collect their business-related data, and uh, they store them in a very structured way, in databases and data warehouses. Uh, but is that all? Uh, are we done with uh, data-related changes? I think not, because there is a new era that has been arriving, and this is the, the era, I think, of connected data. And, uh, and of course now we can combine uh, data, internal data from companies and external data at a very higher pace. Think about, for example, telematics, weather data, social media data. All these data can be now, very, this external data can be combined with internal business data and create considerable value. For example, when you want to, for some products, uh, combining weather data with the previous sales allow you to do much better forecasting of sales of these products. Marketing, for example, when you combine marketing data with, um, with data from social media that reveal a lot about the person's personal preferences, then that allows to do much more targeted marketing. And there are many examples of this that we can think about connecting data, of business and uh, external data. Now, uh, in particular, in geodata, data sets that carry geospatial information are of, uh, are of great importance and can create uh, considerable value. You can find this uh, geospatial information, for example, in maps, in satellite or airborne images, sensor networks, social media, web services, and IT devices. But also you can find data sets that carry geospatial information uh, in government and open data, in data sets from government uh, sources or um, open data initiatives. And this particular, it has been shown already that this type of information can, uh, can create considerable value uh, for many sectors. There are many applications that can be done by using geospatial data. And the sectors, for example, like the financial sector, insurance, reinsurance, uh, uh, construction, retail, and so on, they can really benefit by the use of this uh, geodata. Now, in particular, I'll focus on uh, data sets that carry geospatial information uh, that we have here in Switzerland. So if you go, if you go and you go through, for example, opendata.swiss or the statistical atlas of Switzerland, the startup, like these are sources of uh, open data for Switzerland, geodata of Switzerland, startup interactive database, uh, and various resources, especially the Federal Statistical Office, then you will find there data sets that connect, connect very nicely uh, regional information, regional uh, characteristics, with other characteristics in other domains, like uh, population characteristics, uh, the work sector, education, science, mobility, politics, tourism, and so on and so forth. So let me be a bit more specific about this data we have from all these sources. So what we have is that, for, for example, for various regional levels, for example, for the 26 states or countries, as we call them here in Switzerland, you can have information for each one of them. You can have information about all these features and attributes, like for age, marital status, language, or the population that live there. The same also you can do if you go one level uh, deeper, like in every <coughs> district, we have more than 120, we can separate Switzerland in more than 120 districts. So you can have all this information here uh, for every of these districts. The same also applies for the political communities of Switzerland. Switzerland can be separated in more than 2,500 political communities. And for each of these communities here, <coughs> we can have all these features and attributes. The lowest level we can have also publicly available data is really blocks of 100 meters time, 100 meters. And for these small, very blocks in Switzerland, we do have not all of these features, but we have a lot with respect to the population. And this is something that can be used. 
Uh, <clears throat> what does this power of these data lies? I think the power of these data lies in the diversity across the regional levels. For example, <clears throat> if you take the political communities, as I said, we have more than 2,500 2, political communities who can divide Switzerland. And if you take, for example, the quota of persons between the age of 0 and 14, you will see a histogram uh, distribution that looks like that, which means that not all the political communities are the same. You will find political communities in Switzerland that they have like a fraction of 10%, percent percent of 10% of young people, and others which are 25. And this is exactly this diversity that we exploit and we create value from. So this diversity we have across this, um, uh, <coughs> these regions is really the key to informativeness in the thing we use. So let me very quickly ask you, who from this room knew about these data sets that exist in the public available? Okay, so pretty much half of the audience. Okay, that's good. So the rest of the half you're going to hear something new, I guess. Okay, so uh, let me guide you through the presentation a bit. Uh, I'm going to first um, uh, tell you about uh, how we can use this data in order to understand products. And when I say understand, I mean to really uh, 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 try to infer a bit about the customer, some, some things about the customer segment that prefers a product and then combine that in order to assess sales efficiency at the regional levels. I'll also, talk, I'll also discuss about how we can use this data to optimize promotion events, which is very useful for marketing. I also will talk about how to use this data for one-to-one -one marketing, and I will focus also on the insurance sector there. And uh, last, very briefly, I will talk about how to use this data for market forecasting and uh, design of marketing experiments. So let's go to the, to the first uh, part, which is product understanding and uh, sales efficiency. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell a lot about our client that work with this project uh, because due to non-disclosure agreements. But <coughs> it's a, it's a, our client was a food manufacturer here in Switzerland. And uh, as a food manufacturer, they sell uh, their products to food retailers. Here in Switzerland, we have these uh, big supermarket chains like Coop and Migros. So they sell their products there. And the question we have for this project is, if we take one product, let's say, what is really the customer segment that prefers this product? Now, typically, if you want to answer such a question, you would need to have the sales. You, have, you will need to have like uh, uh, information on the persons, like uh, gender, date of birth, age, and so on. And for these uh, customers, you would know anything about your sales, and then you're trying to explain the sales with respect to these uh, demographic characteristics, let's say. But in our case, our, our, our client was a, it's a B2B company. So they don't have access directly to, uh, to, the end, to the end customer, right? So how in the world we can understand a product in a data-driven data -driven way if we don't have information about the end customer? So the key idea here is exp exactly to exploit this regional diversity and to use all these, <coughs> all these features which are diverse across these regions. So here in green, for example, you can see the centers of the political communities in Switzerland. And the idea here is to, to exploit this diversity we have with respect to these features with the diversity we could have with respect to the sales of the product when we aggregate them at these regional levels. So in fact, what we're trying to do is like to transform a problem which is at the end customer level to transform this problem at the regional level to do this transformation. So let me guide you through the three main, without a lot of details, the three main steps. Of course, we need to do some pre-processing, means that we need to, to geocode some the locations of some retailers, and then aggregate the sales at the regional levels. Then, of course, we have to integrate the data, the demographics and the sales data. And then, of course, we have to do some data analytics and quantify the demographic effects for, uh, to the products. So the fact, of course, of the data analytics is a typical regression analysis. Here we have the dependent variable, which are the sales. And we try to explain the sales with respect to the demographics. And we do that across all our regions. So now our observations in this statistical problem are actually the regions. <clears throat> so if we do that, we end up with a kind of, um, of a kind of fingerprint, of demographical fingerprint about this product. So you can see that we can find out uh, demographic factors which are positively affect the sales, negatively affect the sales. So the positive, you can see them in white the negative in black, and some other factors which do not play any role in the sales, you can see them there in gray. So for example, you can see a, a, a kind of important factor was the quota of family houses here. So you can see, for example, that uh, this particular product that we analyzed, we saw here that it was not um, 
it's not a kind of a family product. It's not so by doing this analysis, you start, you know, start putting a face, let's say, a demographic face behind these products <coughs> and start to understand them. Of course, this is not only that. It's not only about uh, product understanding. Uh, it's also because the, the, the people in the businesses know they, they, they have a good feeling about their products. It's also about taking it one step further and use this information now to assess sales efficiency in, in, at the regional level. So think about, uh, let me give you an example. See about, think about these two sales here, the, in one region called Horgen and, one, and the other region called Lyon. Now, the sales in Horgen are, let's say, around 63 grams. Uh, 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 annual normalized with the population, and the neon are 54 grams annually again normalized with the population. So th these two are now comparable because they are normalized. And when you see that, somebody would say, okay, the sales in uh, Horgen are much more efficient than neon, right? But if I give you also this demographic characteristic, you will see directly that <coughs> in neon we have a lot of families compared to at least to Horgen. So now that you know that this is not a family product, you will start thinking that, okay, probably these numbers actually do not make sense. They, they do make sense because uh, the, the customer segment, which is favorable for this product, doesn't exist so much in the own. You see, there, there are many families, and this is not a family product. In fact, after the analysis, you can see that um, the, the, the picture is quite inverse. So uh, based on the expected, what the model tells us, it turns out that in Horgen, the sales, given the demographics they have there, the sales should have, should have, should have been higher. That's why we have a, a performance deviation of 14%, whereas the sales in Lyon are already much higher than it should have been expected. So now we have a kind of a different picture of what we initially have, because we took the demographics also into account. So whatever is going on there, it doesn't have to do with demographics anymore. It could be other reasons why the sales are not that efficient. It could be, for example, that the product is not very well placed in the shops of these regions. It could be that they, in these regions they run a lot of out-of-stock situations. But whatever the reasons, for sure it's not demographic. And of course, we did this analysis across all regions for our customer, and we find regions that uh, they are actually overperforming in terms of sales and underperforming, and this helps them to do a kind of a knowledge transfer between these regions. Okay, so that's the first part which is the, the product understanding sales efficiency, and that I'll move to the, to the second part, which is about selecting regions for promotion events. Before I go to the details of this project, let me tell you that uh, we can do region selection, but now that we have this data, we can do region selection either at the national level, of course, depending on the problem, or at the city level, because we have also this information about different blocks of 100 meters time, uh, time 100 meters. And uh, this can be very useful for applications that involve advertising, for example, of products, or when we want to choose locations for new stores and stuff like that. Now, uh, in our particular project, our customer was Young, young Swiss. Uh, young Swiss is like um, the biggest trilingual youth organization in Switzerland. And uh, they have more than 160,000 uh, members of young people, people between 18 and 30, in fact. And uh, they, they were going through, when we started the project, they were going through a radical, uh, radical restructuring of their process to acquire members. So what they wanted to do, they wanted to have, uh, you know, to, to, to direct themselves to a different type of young segment they have in mind, which is, which is similar to the customer segment. So they had a kind of a young member segment in their minds. And uh, the question there uh, was to find, they wanted, of course, to do a kind of promotion campaign, which is comprised of various promotion events. And, they want, and the question is to find the Swiss regions which are best for promotion events, given the new customer segment, the new youth, young people segment they're going after, and given, of course, budget constraints they have, because we all, always have this type of budget constraints uh, in our in marketing. So <clears throat> what we did, the first thing to do, was to compute the impact of promotion events in each region. So to, to compute that, we used, of course, local information in the regions, uh, together, with the value, the, together with the current member base they have in these regions and various demographics. And we also used, of course, the various connectivity criteria between the regions. So we treat a region as a kind of a node of a graph, where all the other nodes are other regions. And we're able to compute uh, 
what we call the attracting capacity of the region, meaning how many members can be attracted when a promotion event takes place. So we did that for all regions, and you can see here, for example, uh, number one in terms of uh, attracting capacity for the young segment they had in mind, because this is what we're going after here, uh, it's Zurich, of course. Then, uh, surprisingly, although it's not the second biggest city, it's where we are here in the tour. But if you think about it, it makes sense, because Winnetour is very close to Zurich and other urban regions, is very well connected. That's why when an event takes place here, it can attract a lot of people uh, you know, from these uh, big cities around. And so on. You can have also Geneva, Bern, and so on. But is that all? Uh, no, because when we are talking about now promotion campaigns, the promotion campaigns comprise promotion events. So what we want to do <coughs> is to find the best, let's say that I want to do two promotion events, I want to find the best two regions to hold the promotion event. Now, if I go with respect to the attracting capacity, I would choose probably Zurich and Vinetur, but that's not correct, because these two have a very large overlap in terms of the people that they attract. That means that you're saying uh, twice, you're saying the same message to the same people, twice, to the, two, two times. And we don't want that. What we want to do, we want to, <coughs> to maximize the overall, the national coverage when we do a series of promotion events. So it turns out the best uh, second pair, so if you choose a Zurich, then you have an algorithm that updates all the attracting capacities, given that you have already held a promotion event in Zurich, you update all the attracting capacities, and then you choose the second biggest, which is Geneva, then if you want to do three, it's Bern, and so on. And there is no other combination of the regions that can, take, that can um, reach this 25.9% uh, in terms of national coverage. Of course, if we do that for <coughs> 15 cities, we run this iterative algorithm, and we computed that uh, the attracting capacity can reach, uh, the coverage, sorry, can reach up to 45% by taking this combination of 50 in regions. <coughs> uh, furthermore, we tried also to tackle, of course, something with respect to the budget constraints we have. So if we were to select uh, seven regions, then we end up with uh, two results. First, on the selection of the regions. So here, for example, if somebody wants to do uh, for, for uh, a promotion events in seven regions, then this is the list. It's Zurich, Geneva, Bern, Basel, Lausanne, St. Gallen, and Lucerne. So this is the first result because if you are doing that on a population-based manner, so if you take the seven biggest city, then St. Gallen will not be there in that list. That's the first. And the second, of course, is how to allocate your budget. So by running this quantitative way of thinking, then we told them how exactly to, go to, uh, to, to allocate their budget uh, into these regions. And again, if you do it compared to if you do it just blindly, a bit population-based, then you have, of course, some differences, which means that you can allocate your budget much better if you take all this uh, publicly available zero data into account into your computation. Um, so, the third thing that I would like to talk about is about uh, zero triggers in one one marketing. So, I'll just show a framework which is uh, for insurance companies. Now, nowadays, when we talk about uh, products and channels, so channel is like uh, something that we address uh, uh, our customers like email, phone calls, post, or personal appointment, and products like car in, in, the, in the insurance companies, about car insurers, household insurers, liability, and so on. So nowadays, when we think about channels and products, we tend to think of them as pairs, as one unit, as a product channel pair. And the reason we do that is because nowadays, if you have a very good product, but you don't have a very good channel to push this product to your customers, then that might result to low sales. So it's very, it's very important to think, like, to, to, to think about it as a pair, as a product channel pair. So if you have, for example, let's say, four channels and four products, then of course you create 16 uh, uh, product channel pairs. For example, you can have the marketing action call for car insurance, email, make an appointment, and so on. So the challenge here is really to find the right product channel for each of the customers. Now, the data we use in this type of uh, analysis uh, I'll, I'll just show four categories of data. First of all, personal information about the customers, like gender, age, um, family, nationality, and so on, family status, nationality, and so on. We have also, <coughs> we, we can use also transactional data, like how the customer, uh, what's the transaction between the customer and the company, do they have the car insurance, what type of car insurance do they have, uh, what type of premium they pay, what, what's the duration of their insurance, this type of stuff. 
Then we have also what we call channel interaction data, uh, like what is the channel preference? Do they like phone calls? How, how, how frequently they respond to that? And if we have logins, we, if they can log in you know, to our web page, then <coughs> we can have also information with respect to clickstream data, page views, average session durations, and so on. Uh, and of course, and this is where I'm focusing here, we have also external data. Calendar data can play an important role when we're talking about marketing actions, but also all the external data that I described in the beginning through the address of the person. So we know stuff about the regions they live, right? So we have the demographics of the regions they live. So the overall framework in this case looks something like that. It's a kind of a multi-classification type of problem where you fit all the data of a person and then you have a bunch of classifiers for each product there, and then you compute the probability whether the person would be interested for this product uh, or not. Uh, and that, and that we use in a way that it can be, the idea is to use in a way that's very uh, useful for the salespersons. So we're not trying to substitute here the salespersons, we're trying to assist them, tell them through a system that quantifies this information, uh, when to contact the person, how to contact the person, and with what product they should contact the person. So it gets a kind of notification through this multi-classification type of problem. So, of course, you can have various triggers. As I said, uh, for example, if you log into a page, uh, the clickstream data can give you a trigger, and that uh, affects, the uh, affects the classifier, and then you can get a hit. But you also get this type of uh, changes when an address is changed. So when a customer changes the address, uh, that tells us a couple of stuff about the new region because we know for a fact that the regions in Switzerland are not the same. So sometimes we, have, we know that we have like family regions, we have more expensive regions, we have urban regions, and sometimes when we change an address, that reflects something about our lifestyle or the change, even more important, the change in our lifestyle. So for example, if you find a new well-paid job and you decide to move on a more expensive regions, or if you move to your partner, or if you start a family, then that would be reflected into the new region that you're going to move, and through the change in the demographics we have in the external part of the data set, we can update, the, the, the classifiers are, updates, are updated, and then we can contact uh, the person and give recommendations about some new insurance policy, and so on. So, uh, of course, this framework can be applied also, I've just showed an example in the insurance sector. And uh, very briefly, I will also mention some ideas about how to use this data for market forecasting and design of marketing experiments. So market forecasting is about predicting the demand of products uh, or services, of new products or services. This is very important when a company wants things about launching a new product. So in order to do that, uh, this type of demographic information that we have, uh, which is publicly available in Switzerland, together with some microeconomic indicators, related markets, competition data, and so on, can again be fitted to a forecasting model, which in turn you can predict, you know, in a microeconomic type of way, uh, what would be the demand of these new products and services. And this is something that can be very useful for companies that are thinking about launching new products or services. Uh, the second thing, which is also a bit of a trend, is about marketing experiments. More and more companies nowadays think about doing marketing experiments. And what's that about? This is about the following. Let's say that you have a new product in mind, and you have like four versions of these products, or you have four features for these products. Then the, the, the question is that given a customer segment that you have in mind, which of these four versions of the product is the best? It's a question before a product goes into production, into mass production. So the idea here is to use again this regional information, and do the following. First of all, if you're interested, let's say, for a segment, a customer segment, which is high in education, income, commuting, and they speak German, let's say for some power you're in this segment, then we can tell you which are the 150 regions that they have similar, this customer segment in a similar, that they're similar with respect to this customer segment, and then you can go and run uh, this um, marketing experiment there. Why? Because it will be more efficient, you'll find more, 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 more of these people there. And second, on your results, on your sales results, you, have, you will have decoupled uh, the demographic effect from the, perceived, um, from, the, from the received perception of the product. And this is something very important when you try to compare sales and find out which of these four versions is the best. So in this case, for example, uh, it's, um, it's, the, it's the red version of the product. 
So uh, that's also it. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, I would like to mention that uh, I, I truly believe that uh, this, uh, the, this publicly uh, available zero data are really a very rich uh, uh, source of information, really worth using for various business applications. Uh, what we have seen is that unfortunately not many of the businesses are using them, are using this data. And that's a bit of a pity because you can really gain a lot of value information by using this, uh, uh, this information. Although it's suitable for really uh, different business types and of course can be applied to various type of processes. Uh, so that said, that brings me to the end and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.